Welcome to Night Light. Step away from the mainstream and gather around as we enlighten the world and our realities and travel this cosmic journey we call life. Join us as we share with you and provide that beacon that can guide us all to a better way. Explore with us as we examine a metaphysical montage of spiritual insights covering everything from the mundane to the magical, UFOs to unicorns, and everything in between. This is a time of awakening, of sharing and evolving, of spreading our wings and soaring on the cosmic breath of creation. Come and join with other light-minded spirits as we weave our lights together to seek understanding, enlightenment, and with a little luck, some wisdom. This is Night Light, a reminder that you are never alone. Everybody and welcome to Nightlight. This is our official Christmas holiday show, and Mark has lined up two really, really amazing guests to be on with him tonight with us. Um, they are they are people that uh, both he and I um, have had on other shows before, and they are they have amazing different philosophies as to the season. But um, it, it it all is is meant to sort of make you think, make you wonder, and stretch you just a little bit. He's done an amazing job with this show, so let's bring Mark on. Evening, Mark. Hi, Barbara. How are you? Very well. Has uh, Fluffy the White Squirrel been by? Yes, he has been. <laughs> yeah, I, I I just enjoy. Uh, you know the photos from the uh, the the weekend of him raiding the bird feeder. Yeah, and I've never seen a white squirrel before. I've seen all other colors, but it's the first time I've seen a white one. And um, he just comes and and you know sits down at the banquet table out there with the rest of them. But uh, yeah, it's very exciting. Yeah, I I may have to be in the poorhouse by the time I have a squirrel convention here. I have a, a squirrel buffet out here on my deck, and every now and then a, a bird gets in too. So it's very exciting. <laughs> no, it, you deserve uh, to you just kick, kick back and enjoy the uh, wildlife. I call it Squirrel TV. There you go. <laughs> no internet yeah, well, needed. All right. Well, you get uh, it's uh, less com- combative than uh, Facebook. Uh, or the internet these days. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay, we might as well get uh, started on some of the announcements and working our way towards our uh, panel of experts. But, um, yep, both, yes, of, both um, of which are here. Okay, good. Yeah, um, you know, you know, Blog Talk's English Robo Babe, <clears throat> who's uh, different from a friend from the greater Sheffield metro area who may be listening, uh, has been giving me some flack about the good nights. So I, I'll, I'll be working on <laughs> That, that a little bit starting tonight. So, you know, don't don't want to get fired for the third time in 53 weeks. But you know, you know, she could be AI <laughs> and she, she she might retaliate. But um, let's see. It's, you know, t- and well, uh, you're, the, you're would, the man of a half hour goodbye. I mean, there's yeah. <laughs> so so at at. At 11.30, start saying goodbye, and by the time okay. we get to the time the show's over, maybe you will have finished. 
I'll, I'll, I'm, I'm going to work on it. Okay. <laughs> and uh, tonight's show wouldn't be possible without you know the uh, little mini uh, farmers market convention with Eric and Amy's uh, spinach feta and mushroom ravioli and Sophia and her sidekick kicks. Uh, kale salad and calamata olive bread. That was everything was delicious tonight. Thank you. Uh, it's a little bit like uh, you know the sticker on Buddy Cage's amp. Uh, no coffee, no worky. You know, it's like I just can't do these shows without they're, they're yummies. Um, you know, since it is the season of miracles, and since. Our tech guru, Barbara, found a way to work around Skype's red ring of death. It's a miracle we have a show tonight. But, <laughs> yeah, the audience don't want to know about that. But, no. yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, this, <laughs> um, you know, uh, we, we have fun putting these shows together. This is just the audience uh, just needs, doesn't need to know everything, but it, it's, it, it's fun. And um, you know, tonight is our uh, C- Christmas show, and uh, Barbara, Barbara and I do want to, or you know, we we would like to give our listeners frankincense and myrrh, but we have something even better. We have Reverend Michael Carter and David Collis with us, and both of them are kind of right. Re- you know, David's becoming a, a regular. On night lights, and Michael's been a regular, and you, know, you, you may have seen Michael on um, Ancient Aliens several times. Uh, he's the author of Alien Scriptures and A New World, if you can take it. You know, David was just on uh, Coast to Coast. He's the uh, photographer. He's the author of Interviewing Jesus, and you know I think we have a great. Uh, panel of experts to uh, talk about the season and uh, miracles. Get everyone ready for uh, the big day in a couple weeks. So, uh, w- welcome Michael and David. How are you doing tonight? Hey, thanks, Mark. Thank you, Barbara. Hey, David. Our pleasure. Hi, Michael. What's up? Hey, buddy. Oh, hey, hey, yeah. Uh, uh, Michael, were you affected by the uh, big southern uh, snow, snow that uh, uh, hit, hit your area? Yeah, yeah, well, it's still being affected by it, but, yeah, we survived it. I was in Atlanta Friday to visit uh, some family, and knowing full well that probably wouldn't get back until – Yesterday, which is what happened, and even today, um, I couldn't get into the church. The, the, the parking lot had not been shoveled, and now everything is ice here. And we have a warning, uh, a weather warning tomorrow, just uh, uh, for black ice tomorrow between seven and ten. So yeah, but it, but you know, we, probably just another day, and it'll get back to normal. I hope. Okay. Well, I don't think s- snow lasts all that long in uh, the, the South, so you, you'll you, you'll get through it in, in a short oh, yeah. short period of time. Did you lose power? Well, I heard that we did. I was in Atlanta, which did not get the snow, but we had a lot of wind and rain. But uh, apparently, yeah, we did lose power, and some friends of mine. Uh, had lost power as well. And, you know, even though it's a little bit of snow, I mean, it's not like I'm back in New York or what have you, you know, people aren't used to it. And it's not so much the snow that gets you here, it's the ice. Right. It's really a lot of ice. Okay. So, so, but, you know, look, it's winter time. This is what it is. But, uh, you know, you just deal with it. Yeah. So, hey, um, as we get in, start getting into the show, 
Um, you know, what are some of the e- events that led uh, both of you into having uh, uh, what would be the right word in like in uh, adopting a apostolic lifestyle? Do you, you know, did, did did you feel like you had some kind of calling, or how how did uh, you know, Michael? Did you get involved in the the ministry? And you know, I have the same uh, question for David. How how did you become so interested in uh, writing, uh, interviewing Jesus? Uh, Michael, do you want to go first? Yeah. Um... I always knew when I was a child that I wanted to be a priest, and I'm putting that in quotations. Now, at at one time, you know, I wanted to be uh, a secular priest, if you will, which I was thinking about going to be a therapist. But I knew that I, I, I loved religion, not for what it is, but for what it could be. And so I kind of always knew that. I was very comfortable in houses of worship, worship no matter what denomination or whatever. I don't know whether it was a past life, breathe through. I was just comfortable. And so it, it, that, that was always in the cards in some way. And even when I was an actor in New York, uh, I was still very much into, you know, religion and, and various ways of expressing spirituality. And so it seemed like a natural transition from the theater, being able to give a message to people and being in front of people, using those skills from the theater and, and, and just transferring over to um, to uh, religion. And so the short answer is, on some level, I always knew and always wanted to be uh, some type of clergy person. So I, I would say it was a calling. Um, but it was just always there for me. Okay. And uh, how about you, David? Mine was very different. It happened to start as an initiation, right, in which I had a very severe existential crisis, and so I was looking for answers. And so my journey, my spiritual journey, started from that perspective and from that event. And so I found religion as a solace for the, the conflict that I was experiencing. Hmm. Okay. It was and, a very, yeah, so I didn't feel like there was any calling. I just felt like I had to start somewhere. And so I felt that I, it was important for me to, um, one, heal, and two, learn. And so those were the two big um, – Kind of directives in my life at an early age when I was yeah. a young man. Yeah, uh, uh, you know, a traumatic experience can do that to people. Yeah, it was, certainly was for me. Yeah, you know, that's uh, it's just uh, you know, uh, you know, it's a lot, lot like what Michael says. You know, you just take different ways to get to the same destination. Yes. Yeah, yeah, definitely yeah. different ways, and 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 obviously, uh, very different, uh, very different things that catapult us into that. Uh, uh, certainly, for me, wanting to please my parents was in it. You know, uh, uh, mm-hmm. they were they were church folk and still are, and um, uh, I, that that was certainly there. But there was also a genuine, you know, um, I guess. The best word would be uh, there was something driving me towards it. And, again, I was very, very comfortable, whether I was in a mosque, no matter what denomination of Christianity was there at the time. Uh, um, Of course, when we moved from the project to a predominantly Jewish area of Baltimore, which is where I grew up, um, you know, I just kind of – as my New Testament professor would phrase it, I learned how to walk in different worlds. But there was something that was familiar to me, 
And so that was always the emphasis. And then as I had my own crisis of faith, if you will, I got to see, to look at the similarities, but the differences were pretty obvious uh, wherever your faith tradition was. But I got to see the similarities. And so um, wanting, when I was younger, wanting to stress those, um, but also now being older, to be able to appreciate the differences as well. You know, and so that's okay. You know, Michael, when you talk about uh, walking in uh, different worlds, uh, do, does that uh, seem like an extension of uh, a reincarnation? Um, you know, is there any kind of connection like that where you know, you, uh, you know, felt like you've been a r- religious leader in other lifetimes? I mean, certainly I leave room for that. Uh, yeah, as I mentioned earlier, maybe it was a past life bleed through as far as um, the comfortability to being able to pick up uh, aspects of the various traditions quite quickly. But I also, you know, the the Danish theologian Kierkegaard talks about um, that uh, life is lived forward, but it's only understood backwards. And so, you know, hindsight being 2020, looking backwards, well, I, I don't mean it so much metaphysically. Okay, listen, I'm born in this lifetime. I'm a man of color, okay? Most of my life I lived in the dominant culture because my parents moved from, you know, we moved from inner city to uh, uh, different different, uh, neighborhoods where folk of color weren't really um, kind of there entrenched or or there in any way, shape, or form. I began to be, I, I learned how to walk in different worlds. So I learned how to walk in worlds, uh, you know, I could go to Sutton Place and be at a party. At the same time, I'm just as comfortable up in Harlem. Um, I'm an anti-racism trainer, okay? So I'm, I'm a bridge builder. I'm walking in different worlds, quite literally, and I'm comfortable there, but not being able to see it at the time. So, But looking back, I'm 61 years young, and I'm saying, oh, my goodness, look, uh, I can see where I could connect the dots, and while this event led to that event, which helped me to be here. And that's what I mean when I'm saying I'm walking, whether it's religiously, whether it's racially. Um, we're now, you know, going to these UFO conferences. Um, I'm, I'm able, because of my experiences, to be able to mingle and be a bridge builder in, in various worlds. Mm-hmm. And... and- yeah, you do a great job at that. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, it, but, but yeah, yeah. But but I I do leave open. I do, as you know, I do believe in reincarnation, and uh, so I'm I'm sure that some of those gifts I bring over with me. At some point, you have to keep. At some point, you have to keep asking yourself, if all of those things have been influencing my life, where is it leading me towards? I I have those questions as well. Uh, that's yeah, but, a great the good I- but the good answer is if you knew where you were going, there would be no purpose to the trip. That's correct. But if you kind of look, keep looking backwards and you say, hey, you know what, I think that these are the types of experiences that I probably had in the past <clears throat> life, I wonder what what the end is. So I kind of imagined it as if I were starting off in my life as a laborer and I ended up as the uh, you know the master architect, and I wonder how many lives I would have taken if that was actually the purpose. But it's just those are the types of things that I find interesting. But mm-hmm. it, you know, David, is, you know, you say something similar to that in you know you're interviewing Jesus, where that's on on page sixty. Uh, you know, you have uh, Jesus uh, uh, state to you and your. Yeah, you know, the 
uh, the, you know, the way you have your book structured, it's basically you and Jesus uh, just having a, a discussion. And, and uh, on page 60, uh, you have him say, you know, I felt I was destined for something great, et cetera. Um, you know, it, it's, you know, that destined word, uh, I don't know, maybe it is a little bit of a tie-in with, um, you know, Michael was, you know, being a, a bridge builder, you know, just always felt comfortable be, being in different uh, houses of worship. Uh, you know, what, you know, do, do, do you see that uh, uh, you know when, when when you had Jesus say that was you know the use of the word destined implying something similar to that or, or you know he like there's just some people just have a certain. Uh, inner feeling that they know where they're going? Well, I know that um, I have met younger people and they know exactly what they want to do. And I felt I had some idea of what it is that I wanted to do um, when I was in, uh, as a teenager, but that seemed to have all been disrupted. And so the aftermath of the, the, that experience was that I ended up finding myself in a world I knew nothing about. And I found myself in a world that none of my peers knew nothing about. So I couldn't go to any elders. I couldn't go to any friends and say, these are the things that I'm experiencing. What do you think? There was just no one to go to. So I had to kind of do my own um, self-guided tour, so to speak. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to that particular issue, I feel that there is a place that we get to where we realize where we need to go and what we need to do. And I think that that was a point that Jesus was able to find. And I think that there was probably something very early in his life that he was a prodigy and he was very precocious and he was, good and he was a genius. But I think that he ended up having to find this path. And when I look at the uh, the New Testament, and I see what it took for him to finally find the ministry, there was a point, there was kind of a, a searching for what it is he needed to do as well. It wasn't as clear, it wasn't clear cut. So. Okay. No, that's fine. You know, I think, uh, you know, he, probably most people at 18 probably think they know where they're going, and you know, at, at 52, I'm st still trying to figure out more. Uh, what happened? Y y yeah, I, I, I got. I got I really. I the exit somewhere. Y yeah, I, 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 I got derailed somewhere. I think Barbara's picking up the pieces for me, but. Uh, yeah, uh, but yeah, I, I'm sure. Most of the people listening to us, uh, you know, can, can relate to that, and you know, I think, you know, I think that's one of the nice things about, you know, having you two as, you know, like, our resident theologians. Uh, and, well, you know, Barbara uh, would, would be one too. You know, th you know, three, re uh, three. Uh, Theologians with us tonight, and you know, just yeah. it just kick you know just kick around ideas about you know where are we all going, and you know, uh, hopefully the listeners will just realize, hey, you know, just pick up some ideas on what we all have to say, and hopefully get people uh, on the right track, and you know, just everyone moving forward to something. Uh, better in the future, and you know, even, even with uh, you know, uh, working with Michael at the ARE conference was it like four years ago. 
uh, you know, he's talking about uh, being a, a bridge builder. Um, you know, just a lot of people, uh, you know, just really fl- flocked to him and asked him a lot of questions during his, uh, you know, when he'd pause during his lecture or two, uh, see if, you know, uh, the, you know, the audience had you know, resonated with his discussions, and you know, people were you know, just f- felt very comfortable talking about their uh, experiences. And you know, yeah, I've seen you know, seen that uh, in, in person. So, you know, it's you know, I think Michael has a lot of those. Uh, unique qualities that allows him to be a bridge builder. You know, well, I wanted to just mention this, if I might, Michael, for a second. You mentioned the idea yeah. that, that we're all theologians, and there is an aspect of theology that I find very intriguing and fascinating, but I've also kind of recognized that we don't want to be too we don't want to be living so far into our mind that we only think of things from an um, intellectual point of view. There is a whole life that we've, that we've lived, and there's a lot of experiences that we've had, and there's a lot of books that we've read, and there's a lot of trails that we've walked. And all of that feeds into this river of our, of our lives. And now the fact that there's this confluence which we're all together at this moment, you know, speaking kind of um, goes to this idea that, Somehow there's a you know a greater web out there and and connection, and that our ideas are one way of connecting, but so are our lives and our hearts, and the, our experiences. Mm-hmm. And and, and that, that's a good point. And you know, I I just hope, I just think that you know that a show like this. You know, uh, uh, would you, you use the metaphor of you know flowing? You know, just I just ho- hope that with all the things that are discussed tonight, I I, I just hope that the the flow for the listeners just you know scoops them up and you know just move, you know, moves downstream instead of so many people going upstream. You know, against the current. Well, Mark, don't you think too that that any anyone who is on a spiritual journey is continuously learning, continuously growing, continuously mm-hmm. expanding consciousness, right. and it's important for people to realize that you, you it's not so much reaching an end game because once you reach the end, you start over again. So, but it's it's a matter of of being perceptive and taking everything in as you go along the way, and and the the universe gives us um, hints and suggestions all over the place, and it's I think one of the biggest things that that I tell people is to be aware, uh, pay attention because there are signals and signposts along the way if you open yourself up to them, so you you can't stray. Right. Comments, anybody? And, no, uh, yeah, and you know we've been talking about those in, in the evenings as well. You know, we don't need to bore the audience with them, but uh, no, you know, <laughs> I, 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 but the you know like uh, uh, working, uh, you know, you get uh, today's show on. You know, there's you know there are some obstacles, but you know we're growing from it and. Uh, you know the show still happened, and I, you know, hey, I'm 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 not all that great of a producer, but hey, you know, we all kicked around some ideas, and the the show's happening. So mm-hmm. it's, you know, we're all learning, and you know, we had to see, deal with the red ring of death for a little bit this afternoon, but hey. Uh, we work through it. Well, I want right. to say, first of all, uh, um, uh, first of all, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Mark, for that generous, um, <laughs> generous comment. I am hardly a theologian. I, I, I wish I was, but I appreciate you saying that. 
I think that one thing that, uh, and I feel that one thing we want to bear in mind is that for many people, this is a difficult time of year. There are family dynamics. Uh, there's the gross commercialism of the season, and um, I, you know, that 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 that's always been for many people, you know, this contradiction in terms of talking about peace on earth when there are probably over 200 and some wars going on in some way, shape, or form on the planet. And I think that one must must bear that in mind with all the goodwill and the good intentions that this is a rough time for many people. And so I would hope that those listening would know, would realize that we know that. Uh, we're not trying to pour pink paint over, uh, over anybody's uh, life situation, but just hopefully you will know that there are other people who realize that there are other people out here with their backs against the wall, and this time of year is particularly difficult for them and that there are other people who uh, will at least acknowledge that and, and know that our thoughts and prayers are out there with you. And, and I think also, Michael, if I can add to that, um, everyone, this is a time of year where everybody is looking around and buying gifts and giving gifts and, you know, traumatizing their, their credit cards and their wallets tremendously. And I want to bring it down to the greatest gift you can give someone is your time uh, to listen to them, to pay attention to what they're saying, to spend time with them. Your time is the only thing that you, you just can't add to. You can't earn more of your time. Our time on this planet is limited. And if you give of your time of yourself, that's a much greater gift than whipping out a credit card or writing a check. <clears throat> and listening. Yeah. Absolutely. And uh, David, you uh, do do mention in uh, uh, it's more than mention. You, you, know, you do devote um, considerable uh, passages about um, Jesus's concern with. Finances and you know Barbara just brought brought up the you know maxing out your credit card for Christmas and uh, you know you as you profile uh, Jesus um, you 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 do uh, uh, get get into his uh, background with um, you know the family finances and how he viewed money as a um, dur- during his ministry. Uh, do you want to tell us a little bit about um, that aspect of Jesus' life? The fact of kind of the idea of using his wealth or the, if I understand you correctly, is whether or not he, uh, he came from a wealthy family or if he mm-hmm. was okay. Uh, It's my feeling and it's my assessment uh, that he did come from a family that was wealthy. Um, There was also a reference that his mother, Mary, uh, in Luke, was a woman of means. Uh, He uses money in a variety of ways. And one of the ways that he uses the metaphor of money is investment. And he saw that what he was doing was like investing in a, a product, not only in himself, but in his the idea of the Father. And so he, when he went out into the world, he understood how money is affecting people. And obviously in his society, there was a great big problem. And there seemed to be two parts to the problem. One is that people were really, really greedy And two, there was a great deal of people who were very, very needy. And so he was trying to encourage people on the the one side of that equation, the poor. And he would say, blessed are the poor, you know, and they will receive the the kingdom of heaven. You know, um, blessed are the hungry because they will be fed. He was a man that kept on encouraging. He was a man who saw this horrible plight. 
both from a physical point of view and from a um, spiritual point of view and kind of a, a spiritual philosophy point of view and from a material point of view. And so he kind of he also was recognizing that there were riches in heaven that we should all you know recognize that were really real and that we should try to attain those. And part of that riches in heaven is the compassionate heart. So when Michael is saying there's a lot of needy people out there, there are. There's a lot of needy people just everywhere. I'm I'm just coming across them more and more these days, and it is it is kind of shocking to sense just how um, what kind of state of affairs we are in. It makes me very nervous. And I. I, um, in part parts of your book, you, know, you do emphasize the prodigal son, and uh, that seems to be going on a lot today. Too, you know, it's sad to see uh, those kind of situations uh, happening on a regular basis. And that has to deal with uh, you know, squ- squandering uh, finances as well. That's not what the season's about. Uh, well, I think that we have um, have moved kind of beyond some of the the um, precedent that the season has offered and was supposed to recognize. And at the same time, our society seems to be really moving in a direction that is either giving birth to something uh, incredible or we're spiraling down very quickly into something that might be very uh, ominous. And I think that that what's kind of on our – in the future is something that's very, very new to a lot of people, and we have to sort through and work through – what these what this new horizon is for us and i'm hoping that materialism might at least in some respects just kind of slow down a little bit but um yeah, yeah, I don't know if yeah, that's there's, happening yeah there's an interesting article in uh the Pittsburgh uh post gazette yesterday about you know, the uh Unrestrained capitalism is a, a major problem. Yeah, that's probably a little bit about what you're uh, talking about. It's being discussed by you know, uh, major newspapers as well. I've been around rampant um, entitlement, and it's just, it's very disturbing, and it's very upsetting. And I can understand why Jesus' brother James would say in his epistle that the rich people are just, um, there's, it's very problematic. Okay. Uh, uh, what, uh, what, what, what have you seen? Um, I have heard stories from friends who are involved with um, some extraordinarily rich people and the rich people are saying, why would I have to pay, you know, my employee health care when, you know, they have just gobs of money? So I, I don't quite understand that. I have mm-hmm. uh, I know of people who have had um, uh, or have heard of these stories. Again, these are people that I know. Um, they their their children get um five thousand or what is it, four thousand, three thousand dollars a day to spend money. Just Jeez. whatever they want to spend money on. I mean I just find that this is so disgusting. Um I know that there's people that I've met whose parents were very, very wealthy and they just felt like they can just live off of their parents um uh success and they never grow up and they're just, you know, infantiles. They're just infants. But they have these, you know, twenty thousand dollar a month um, habits. You know, yeah. I'm we're I'm finding that you know just trying to 
you know, make a living and trying to live a, an authentic life is just really challenging these days in a way that I hadn't experienced before. But these are very yeah. dark times. So some people just have these very, you know, I, I don't think anybody's lives are easy, but there's just this element that's out there that's just, uh, it's just egregious, you know, what, what some people have and what they're not willing to help out and give. So you know, there's a complete disconnect. You know, uh, M- Michael, what could be some solutions that, uh, you know, for the you know, I- I- examples David gave us, you know, from, you know, all, all the – religions you study you know, how, how do we change uh some of the some of these uh behaviors and well, how people not that, to be yeah if, if i knew that brother we, we, we would all put nobel prize money because uh but this is something that has been going on um uh, probably since human beings have been on earth and we started with these certain these various systems of government, of course, capitalism, uh, the egregiousness of it is very. In the optics of it are, are, you know, we could say even Ray Charles could see it because capitalism requires an underclass, uh, um, and so Winston Churchill said many years ago. I'm paraphrasing. It's the worst form of government, but it's the best one we have. Um, I, I would be careful though with lumping all rich people. In, um, in 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 this kind of bucket of being greedy, and because I I I have very 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 wealthy friends here, and uh, and, and sometimes I've having I, I'm in some cases I've never been around such opulence, and they are very giving uh, people. They share their wealth and what have you. So I just want to put that out there, but I think we also have to let people. You know, people. Um, you know, there's the old saying is that when you expect people to act like you want them to act, you'll always be disappointed. And and, and and Barbara brought up the word consciousness about 10 or 15 minutes ago, that people are in various stages of evolution. And part of that growth is about how we look at abundance, um, how we interact with people who are different from us. And because there's a continuum and people are at different places, I mean, Jesus had to deal with this. The Buddha had to deal with this. This is nothing new in the history of humankind. There's, there's, there's always been this, uh, yes. th- these disparities. Now, if you want to look at how Sweden or Denmark, there's their political and cultural system, how they have a more equitable distribution of wealth, that's one model. But, you know, the, the thing is, is that where people are in their consciousness, when I was, I, I got to be honest with you. Yes, everything that we're talking about here is true in quotations, but I love the season. I know people go off and they spend money, but you know how people spend their money is really none of my business because I can't control it. When I get money, I try to do what I feel is, um, is, 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 is appropriate for me because I don't believe that money is the issue. I believe it's our attitudes about money that are the issue. And if you come from a, a place of scarcity, which our culture has taught us from a kid, there's never enough. There's never enough. In order, uh, who was it who said that the thing in America, oh, God, was it Gore Vidal, that uh, America, not only does somebody have to win, but somebody has to lose. And so, you know, if, if you have to watch out. If Mark gets more, don't let Mark get more. Don't let David get more. Watch out. Don't let Barbara get it. We, 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 we're taught this, that, if, if, that if, if, if someone else gets something, then that means it's left for me. And so there's a shift of consciousness. We're seeing it in politics. We're talking people are actually talking about uh, democratic socialism or more equitable, equitable distribution of wealth. But human evolution is glacial at times, especially when you're in it. And so this may be a lesson for our culture that we have to go through. Because these are the choices that we are making collectively. And they affect each and every one of us, 
but because we believe in separation, the illusion of separation, then we believe if David gets more, then there's less for Michael. If Michael gets more, there's less for Barbara and Mark. So in, in, in some ways, unlearning a way of thinking is more difficult than learning something new. So it takes a lot of patience and also, you know, again, uh, that, that kind of non-attachment where, you know, I can't control how other people spend their money. I can uh, um, use my life as an example if I am fortunate enough to get some means to, 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 to uh, you know, to illustrate this is, this is abundance, it's not scarcity, I will have my needs met, there always will be enough. But if you focus too much on how, what other people are doing, you'll always be disappointed. The, also, the other thing is, is what you kind of mentioned is that there's a lack of empathy and there's, there's a very competitive mode. So um, I think this is a, somewhat of an issue. And I've tried to make it so that I become less competitive and less um, interested in making gobs and gobs of money. I just feel like, as you were saying, you know, what, what, where's the richness in, in my heart? Where is the compassion that I have for someone else? Where is the disparity? How can I help? And I feel like that's the point of the season is to recognize that there has been gifts that have been given to us and that we can keep sharing these types of gifts. Yeah, and I, I think you just uh, s- summarized uh, the the intent of the show is just keep giving the the gifts and you know, I think what everyone said is uh, something that we can uh, conclude this in you know, 2018 with and you know just carry it on into the the new year and beyond and I, I think everyone's just doing a terrific job of just presenting their little insights here, here and there and hopefully we can uplift it, uplift humanity yeah i have a question for you guys um during the time of Jesus or shortly thereafter, up to present, the aspect of religion or faith has, has always played a large part in people's lives. How do you see it evolving through time, and how do you see it different today than it was way back? Do you want to answer that, David? Michael? Well, I, 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 if, yeah, I, I, if I'm hearing you correctly, well, I think I think religion, un, religious understanding, spiritual understanding evolve, and I think as we evolve, uh, uh, we will have our own different concepts. Um, I think this is why we have a lot of the people called the nuns, N O N E. They have no religion, or they they they've kind of forged their own. Um, perspective or, or, or Veltenchung about how the world works. I think that is healthy. I think, and I'm a clergy person now. For many clergy may say, well, that means less people in church, but that to me, I, I don't worry about that so much. That people are trying to find their own inner compass, if you will. And I know Einstein had talked about the religion of the future, at the, and he said at the time that Buddhism met the criteria but it would be a religion that merges science and nature. And so it, it, it does take away the, uh, the idea of a personal God for some. The Dalai Lama talks about uh, what they, well, they use the word secular very different than we have in the West, but a secular code of ethics uh, where we can all agree to disagree, but we come together around the things that we need to in order to continue the survival of the species. Now, that again, that is slow, but I, I, I see more of it happening. I'm in a very progressive denomination who was open to that, uh, you know, long ago as a Unitarian Universalist. And at the same time, uh, 
I also see people, and this has happened through time, the more uncertain times get, the more uncertain geopolitical and cultural events get, we go back to the tried and true. We know it. It makes us, us comfortable. It doesn't even have to really make sense sometimes, but it's what I know. And the devil I know, the coin of phrase, is, 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 is safer than the devil that I don't know. Uh, on top of all that, we see the rise of religious fanaticism in the West as well as in the East. There's an old story I'll share with you very quickly that Krishnamurti told, um, and he talked about uh, one day, it was what, well, one evening, the devil and a good friend were leaving a nightclub, and they were feeling pretty good. They were feeling buzzed, and they were walking and talking and laughing, and all of a sudden they see this guy maybe 20, 20 feet ahead of them. He, he bends down, he looks around, he picks up something, and he puts it in his pocket, and he runs on. So the devil's buddy says, did you, did you just see that? Did, did, you, did you see what, did, what was that? And the devil says, come on, don't worry about it. It's not a big deal. And they keep walking. And his friend says, no, no, I can't. What was that? What did that guy have? And the devil says, look, you, you, you're a buzzkill. Let's enjoy the evening. The guy won't let it go. Finally, the devil says, okay, if, if you really have to know what it was, it was just a piece of the truth. And his friend goes, oh, my God, a piece of the truth? He goes, that's not going to bode well for you. And the devil says, don't worry about it. I'll help him organize it. <laughs> so we also have a lot of that going on. Mm-hmm. You know, there's one thing that I've noticed, and, and since I've kind of spent some time with Carl Jung and and um, Joseph Campbell, we're dealing with large archetypes. So I don't think the archetypes are going to be going away. It's just how we're going to, and, and the fact that we have our own kind of, um, if we were to start asking ourselves, you know, what are some of the common denominators of people who are on a spiritual journey? What does it look like? And you're going to start seeing that there are some um, some signposts along the way that is very common to many people. So the question becomes, is that going to be? Does that somehow does that change, or is the the journey somewhat archetypal? And I'm um, the belief that right now that the, the human nature is human nature, and so that we have these deep seated um, archetypes that we're living out and energies that we are participating in, and that we will always be doing that. The question becomes: is how many people are going to be participating in say this sacred journey? of self-discovery, and are all the answers going to be somewhat the same? So I think that there's going to be, a, I think that you know, human nature is what it is, and so there's going to be um, that idea that is going to be moving forward in the future that's going to be similar so we can kind of look back and go, hey, you know what these people were experiencing a 1,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago, 3,000 years ago, it's all relatively the same. So what might be new? Is it new attitudes? Is it new perspective? It's new um, um, philosophy? Is it new technology? And all of those are the the unknowns. But there is something that is known. The other part is that um, all of the big religions that we are living in at the present moment, the big five, are all agricultural religions. And these religions are coming from a very specific cultural attitude and time in which evolution has been affecting this current. And one of the elements that seems to be consistent with big changes in consciousness, so to speak, is metal. So we went from tin to copper to um, uh, bronze, and now we're and then iron, and now iron ore, and now we've moved into the more exotic things like plutonium and and titanium and whatnot. And the industrial revolution has accelerated, you know, where we go and what we can do, and how we organize, and what kind of tools we can make, and all of that is going to be, you know, influencing where we go in the future. So there's quite a bit that's going on in here. 
Um, but my feeling is is that there will be a dissolution to some of the religions, the, the our agricultural religions, and and then there's going to be some new inf uh, insights in, that uh, technology and science are going to bring to the equation, and then there will be the blending again. I, I'd also like to add another thing, though, that 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 will not go away. So simply is 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 this idea of biblical or scriptural literalism. A lot of the things that David just mentioned are anathema to societies and cultures who fear that science will become or has become the new God. And so when you look at religious fundamentalism, um, which is fairly recent in, in maybe the past three, four hundred years, maybe even less, uh, the, the idea that uh, you know, the, uh, a lot, there's no room for archetypes. There's this happened or it didn't. So if there's this literalism. And, of course, we know the old saying that just because something uh, didn't happen doesn't mean it's not true. However, it's this idea that this, that, and, and this is what some archetypes and uh, things can be about, but there's this thing that this happened. This is not metaphor. This is not archetype. This is the literal truth. This is where we're going to continue to struggle as religions get a little more progressive. Uh, I'm thinking more like, for instance, the Episcopal denomination, of course, Unitarian Universalism, United Church of Christ. Um, and, and, then, and we see it now. There's, there's no, this is not metaphor. Jesus is coming back on the cloud. And he's going to separate the sheep from the goat. The Bible says what it means and means what it says. The Quran says what it means and means what it says, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And this is going to be the challenge as we go forth, this, this fundamentalism uh, that we're going to have to deal with as we, move, as we move forward. And isn't that walking between two worlds as well? Very much so, because the, the, the challenge begins when people go to Thanksgiving, and if you're a Trump supporter, and I'm my, I, but I'm not, and I'm sitting across the table, and how do I coexist with my family and not get into these heavy discussions? Or, you know, if I'm a Tea Party person and you're not, it's, it's how do we bridge those worlds? Yes. Um, and, and, of course, who knows the answer? We, we may know how to do it individually, and that's extremely important. And I think that's more important because 8 billion people, well, let's not even go global, just the, the number of people in the United States, we're not always going to, we're not going to be at the same page at the same time. So we cultivate, as David uh, talks about the teachings of Yeshua, you know, I cultivate inside this kingdom of heaven where I, I can accept people where they are. I can be as non-judgmental as possible. It, 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 that, that, that's the inner journey. Uh, now, I, I may not get my neighbor to do it, but I certainly can live it. But these are the challenges as we go forth because we have the technology, but we don't have, and King talked about this, so again, this is nothing new, uh, uh, we don't have the spiritual maturity to go with the technology that we have. So we make missiles, we make drones, we get money, and we just take more and more from people who don't have, or we try to eradicate them or erase them. Uh, these are the challenges that have been going on some time millennia. The Roman Empire played hardball. Uh, uh, the Babylonians played hardball, yes. and, and and they didn't they didn't want to see they didn't want to see Jeremiah and Ezekiel these eighth century they didn't want to see them coming because if you saw them coming you know it was going to be thus saith the Lord. And you're giving me a headache because I'm not doing what I need to do, and I really don't want to hear it. Prophets didn't always live a long life, so here we are <laughs> at, at, in the crossroads. Here, you know, yeah. Here comes David again. He's going to tell me some mess. I don't have time for David. Here comes Barbara. I don't have time for this stuff this morning. And so um, he, here we are again. The, the stakes much higher. Uh, be, because we can destroy ourselves several times over. So how do we live? And, and I throw this out to my brother David. 
it's rhetorical, but the question becomes, because when I read your book, I see a larger question. How, do, how does one live in empire? How does one live in empire? Because make no mistake, we do live in an empire. Yes. We got 200 and some military bases around the globe. So Jesus faced this. Buddha faced on a, on a smaller scale. Uh, 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 Krishna, faced, you know, how do how do I treat God's children, if I, if I can use that phrase, with integrity? Living in empire, because Jesus had to struggle with it. It cost him his life. King had to struggle with it. I'm not saying that everybody has to struggle with it. You're going to wind up on a cross or shot on a balcony in Memphis. That's, that, that's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying, how do I keep this inner life going when all around me, uh, uh, you know, that, that I'm, part, I'm part of empire, whether I want to be or not? I, and I don't expect an answer to that. But the question is, how do we live in empire? And I think Jesus is one of the greatest examples of how to do that. And, and part of the experience that Jesus had and what he was um, offering was very different than some of the other men that came before him and, the, and some of the men, the Galilean men that came after him. So there was one man named Judas the Galilean who said, hey, um, all the Jews who were uh, acquiescing to the Roman Empire and accepting the um, the taxes, uh, you're not worthy of living. And so he and his disciples went on a rampage. And then John the Baptist um, was mentioning how to deal with the problems of the society and that how to make ones to, to prepare for this inevitable event that is supposed to be happening and then jesus comes along and says let's all just be compassionate and love one another and forgive one another and so these are all very different kind of modalities on how somebody's dealing with the struggles of having to live with within an empire and exactly. part of an empire exactly. so they're going to you're going to see different expressions of that but Jesus' expression was, let's not lose our connection to ourselves and to our brothers. And we are all brothers. And if we live through our heart, we will recognize everybody as a, as a family member. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, 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 it's, really, it's, really, uh, it's really crucial. I'm sorry, Mark, did I cut you off? No, I was just going to uh, say that uh, yeah. what David said about everyone's family is, you know, uh, you know one of the points of th- this time of the year is uh, it's a family uh, e- e- uh, c- celebration. I, that was basically it. Well, I want to say, you know, I'm always leery of the family – uh, uh, illustration. I, I, it is true on one level, but you know, sometimes, man, your family can can screw you worse than your enemies can. You know, because <laughs> families can be very dysfunctional. You know what I mean? That sometimes they'll they'll hit you harder than your enemy will. The thing is, though, and and and, and we wrestle with this now. I think collectively, uh, people will say, "Let's love one another." Got no problem with that. But the question is, what will that love look like? Because we can all hold hands, and I'm just being devil's advocate, and in some ways I'm not. We can all hold hands and sing kumbaya, but that doesn't mean that power doesn't shift. We can all start loving each other right now at 11.03 Eastern Standard Time. But, but people want to say, you know, and people want to, I'm one of them, but what does that look like? And, and, and Jesus, not the only person, but he said, this is what love would look like. You would care. And, and he got his stuff from, I mean, we could argue um, other things, but he got, he comes from that tradition of the 8th century Hebrew prophets. Okay, they, okay, they were his forerunners. You were kind to the widow and the orphan. You fed him. So it's, there's a power dynamic, which we don't talk about, because power gets to be a scary word. But in order to, to make that love look like something, there has to be a shift in power dynamics. 
And so it's, it's got to be more than just let's all hold hands and be a family. It's got to be what does that look like to the person whose back is against the wall? There's a wonderful, 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 wonderful book called Jesus and the Disinherited. It was written by um, Dr. Howard Thurman, who was Dr. King's mentor. To those listening, I commend even, you know, reread it if you've read it, uh, but I commend it to you highly. And it talks about the spiritual genius of Jesus, which David talks about, um, you know, about loving your enemy and, you know, people, you know, Mandela talked about he comes out of South Africa, he's been in prison, and he said, I had to give up my, my, my ego, my, my, my thirst for revenge, because I would still be in prison. That's a very, very difficult thing to do, and we can't it expect is. everybody to do that. But on the other hand, if we're going to have the world that we want to say we have, we're each going to have to learn to do that. What Marianne Williamson said that uh, sometimes you have to accept the apology you never got. You have to forgive it. There's also a bit of a, the, the heart of Jesus that I'm becoming more and more intrigued and fascinated by, and it's the supple heart. It's the heart that can expand and, and embrace. And part of my journey of the heart, I mean, I have like the journey of the mind and by reading all the books that I've done and having all the experiences, but there's also the journey of the heart. And how hard is your heart? How broken is your heart? How how many types of things have happened to an individual where their heart is no longer functioning on a spiritual level, but it has just literally collapsed and has become as hard as a rock. Well, how do we turn that rock into something that's supple? And that's the the experience that I'm having at the moment. And I have had uh, a lot of people that I have lost recently through um, – disease and old age and whatnot and it's just really hard for me to look at my family and go i don't want to have anything to do with you well why would i want to do that i i want to have more time because i've had my sister she died of cancer it's like boy wouldn't i just give anything back to be able to be with her so where's the heart in all of that and i just think that if we just part of at least my journey is the journey of the heart how do we embrace each other's pain? And can we do that? And as soon as we start doing that, we can start actually empathizing and being part of a greater breathing and a greater movement and an energy in which we are connected not only by mind but by heart. And it's the heart that's actually the most important. Okay. And... You know, um, my, Michael said you know, uh, a few minutes ago about um, you know, looking at that, like uh, when he was discussing uh, you know the little literal interpretations of the Bible and it's, you know, uh, some may say you know like this this didn't happen. And you know, uh, David, with uh, some of the things you uh, j- uh, just said, um, you know, uh, like you know, the uh, ha- having empathy. Uh, um, that's a little bit of segue into my next question is in um, you know, D- David, you're. In, Interviewing Jesus and in Michael's uh, A New World, if you can take it, uh, you know, but both of you do uh, draw on uh, some of the books from the uh, Apocrypha. Um, what, yeah, what insights did those um, books? Uh, ha- uh, provide for you know your research and you know how did they get, give you uh, n- new insights into the non-traditional 
views of you know scripture. Do you want me well, to? Well, oh, uh, uh, yeah, David, do you, you want, want to go first? Yeah, go on, Dave. I, I need to formulate something because I don't know. <laughs> this is a very uh, this is a very big question, <laughs> and, um, and thank you for. Um, Asking it and letting it go first so I can stumble yes, along yes, here. Gonna say, <laughs> <laughs> and you can just sit back and go, now, wait a minute. Okay, so uh, uh, this is basically how I run the show each week. So uh, this is, you know how I feel. <laughs> You're empathizing with me. Yeah, yeah. You're on, David. I'm uh, waiting now. Okay, more, I'm up to more. bat. Okay. You're on deck there, Michael. Um, <laughs> so... Let's just look at it this way. I know what scriptures mean to people, and I know what it meant to me, and I know how I look at it. And so I look at that there is the light of the divine, and the light of the divine is shining, and part of the shining is through literature. And that's been why we call history history. Prehistory is before writing. History is when we started to write. And when we started to write, we started to tell stories. And these stories, not only tell stories, but write the stories. And there is some fundamental issues that all humans at all times are facing. How am I going to survive? How are we going to get through this? There are good times, there are bad times. I have family. Where am I going to get my next meal? Um, what happens in case there's a disaster, and how come I'm going to die? And these issues are so deeply rooted into our matrix, into our DNA, into our consciousness, that there's no way of getting out of it. So when you look at the types of literature, you can say, well, this one's the most inspired versus this is not the most inspired. I try not to look at it from that point of view, I guess I'm a heretic because I don't look at it that way. I see human expression and human uh, ingenuity and human creativity and human insight. And who knows what other people were, what kind of experiences those people were having. I mean, when you think about the Book of Enoch, that is the strangest of all books about, you know, the Mm -hmm. watchers and going up into, you know, the first heaven and the second heaven. I think that's what uh, they called it. And what kind of experience would that person be having at that moment? So not only do we have all the other issues that I just mentioned, then you start having these mystical kind of experiences of other realities, of other dimensions, of other creatures that have are much more advanced, that can do things that we can't. And so now there's some new hope or new insight that there are ways that we can be that to somehow achieve those goals, those ends, those new insights. So I see that the the bridge between the Old Testament and the New Testament has that type of dimension to it. At the same time, it's also dealing with what is what the um, the history of Israel, what they were experiencing during this uh, Second Temple period. So there's a gap between um, when they got to return back from Babylon and when the last of the, quote, um, scriptural writings were done, and then that space between when Jesus was born and when Paul wrote his first letter. So that inner testament, uh, uh, inner, I'm losing my mind right here, Uh, that inner testament period, um, that literature I just see as a literature of trying to come to grips with all the new realities that Israel was experiencing. At the same time, we have this new kind of literature that's coming in that kind of has that science fiction element to it. But there's also wisdom traditions. There's the wisdom of Solomon that comes out of that, the Apocrypha. Okay. Uh, Michael, or... uh, I mean, mean, are are you ready? It's not much more... Not much more I can add to that. I mean, I think it, it, it was wonderful, uh, David. I, I, Thank you. Um, it really was. I mean, I, that pretty much sums it up. For me, it, um, now remember, and I know David and I talked about this a long time ago. Um, when, I was, when I was in seminary reading the Apocrypha, 
you know, and by the very definition, these were books that either did not make the canon or, you know, and or were, were said to be not authentic. Who, who, who wrote them, you know? And when I was looking at it I, in seminary and even, you know, now I was looking at it from the uh, a star person perspective, looking at Enoch and how another way to interpret that, using that as an example of one of the apocryphal books. But what it did reinforce for me was that history is written by the victors. Now, I'm not as cynical as Napoleon who says that uh, it's a lie agreed upon, but it showed me the hierarchy. It reinforced the hierarchy of organized religion in the West. Who got to say, this is authentic, this is not. And at the same time, it gave me a new perspective on how to look at the Bible from that lens of were our ancestors talking about um, um, off-world intelligences. So, so it was more of a, um, it wasn't so much a deepening of faith for me. I don't know if that's what you were asking, but it gave me a lens, another lens to look at how uh, the Bible was put together, what was put in, what was taken out. And as David was saying, what were these brothers and sisters trying to describe in their world? Trying, trying, trying to, you know, trying to make sense of uh, what, how, can, how can we keep our tradition? Because now we're threatened. Someone wrote this. Well, well we can't use that. What about this? Oh, that, you know, it's, when human beings get together, it's like, and, and I don't believe in a devil per se, but it reminded me of Krishna Murdy's joke. Uh, we get a piece of the truth, and we build around it, and then we and then we say, as uh, 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 Kegel tells us not to say, "I have not found the truth; I have found a truth." But right. we said, "I have found the truth." We have found the truth, and you know the rest is is you know a mess. Okay. And the literary, the when I, one of the things that I did was I just bought all these anthologies and decided to read them. So, um, and I did it all this self-directed. And there's just so much material out there. So instead of saying this is the the canon, I was looking at it. Well, there are all these other people that are writing too. And what seems, what was on their mind? What were they grappling with? What did they see? How are they seeing it? And what do they want? And there's the the spiritual literature of this Second Temple period, and then the the period within the first, I would say, hundred or hundred fifty years after Jesus, is just a very rich period in which people are trying to figure out all the variations of the empires that have come and gone, um, the, the, the insights that those empires have been able to cultivate, um, the new technologies these empires have brought to the world. So it's a, it's a very dynamic world, and it's very unsettling, and we're kind of going through the same thing. So if Michael and I are writing books, they would be part of an apocrypha at the moment. Okay, and uh, we have about 40 minutes left, so I'm not going to start the goodbyes now. But I I, I did want to just take a a, a minute to give both of you a a chance to plug your websites, and we just haven't done that yet, and and I just wanted to uh, make sure we had time to do that before the end of the show. Well, I have to jump in here because anybody who has ever talked to you on the telephone knows you're incapable of saying goodbye in one word or two words. (laughs) That's what we love about you, Mark. Uh, I I I just feel the you know the 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 love tonight. Thank you. (laughs) Yeah, it's all very heartfelt. Absolutely. Yeah, well, give your give your information, guys, so <laughs> we get it in. 
<laughs> Go on, David. Jump in, brother. Okay. So I have written a book. My book is called Interviewing Jesus the Man. It's my first book. There's going to be others. I have a website. It's called um, it's www.davidcollis.com. That's D-A-V-I-D-C-O-L-L-I-S.com. Um, and my Facebook page is David Coff. Uh, David Collis author. So I am developing a workshop. So I'm hoping that my the audience out there will start visiting my um, website and my Facebook page because I'm going to start putting up new content uh, and I'm going to be having and conducting um, some workshops. Okay. Uh, uh, and, and, and let oh, me oh. Not, let me put a plug plug in because I've read the book and it's a fabulous book. It's it's an easy read. And it's it's entertaining and it's informative. It's 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 something that everybody should read. Yeah, it is a good one. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, and uh, Dave, Dave, where are, are your workshops going to be advertised on your website, or you know, are they going to be in yes, one gonna, area? Yes, I'm going through. I'm going to end up having to do a little remodeling on my social media platforms to start to include some new things. My first and foremost was really focusing in on my book and the content of my book. And now um, the next phase that I want to be involved in is uh, the workshops. So uh, the working title that I'm wor- uh, the working title that I'm dealing with at the moment is um, called uh, discovering uh, discovering the journey. Ooh, sounds okay. interesting. And yeah, and embracing it. So there's a whole part of how one connects back to themselves and to and to the divine, and how we can live our lives in a time of turmoil. Okay. Uh, do, and do, and, do and, you have and any... use Jesus as a model, how he did it. See, almost everything that we've been discussing, everything excuse me, everything that we have been thinking about from Jesus and the point of view that we see Jesus from, most of it comes from the very last moment of his life. And what I was interested in discovering was what happened before all of that. So what did he do before he started his ministry? I know that he, in his ministry he did you know, A, B, C, and D. But he had to get to that point. He had to evolve. He had to learn. So he had two paths that he walked. One was the path of a student, and the other one was the path of a teacher. And so he taught us all of these things at the end of his life. But there were things that had to happen to him that he learned so that he can do the teaching. And it, what my workshop is, is going to explore is all the archetypal um, issues that Jesus ended up exploring and teaching through his life. Okay. So that's cool. my workshop. All right. So, so, sounds great. And how, how about you, Michael? Uh, how can people find out about any of your upcoming mm-hmm. appearances or at uh, conferences? Yeah. What's your uh, website? My, I mean, uh, my 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 website is Michael J. S. Carter.com. Uh, you can go to Amazon and 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 uh, and see my books there. Um, I've written a chapter for a book called Beyond UFOs: The Science of Consciousness in Contact with Non-Human Intelligence. It's in the first volume. Of the chapter is called um, uh, The Spirituality of the Contactee. It's, it's published by the Dr. Edgar Mitchell Foundation for Research into extraterrestrial and extraordinary experiences. I shot some episodes of UFOs, The Hidden Evidence, which uh, should be coming out in April. We just shot a few episodes about two weeks ago in Austin, Texas. And um, in November of 2019, I will be uh, one of the speakers in Laughlin, Nevada, with Paola Harris, among many others, uh, talking about ESP, uh, remote viewing and UFOs. Cool. We have a big lineup coming up. Yeah, yeah and, and yeah. I, 
It's a year I away. want to put a plug in for you, Michael. I've read all of your books, and um, they all ha- they all are very informative. They are very um, insightful, and they they all make you think, which is I think the most important thing a book can do. Oh, thank you, thank you so much. I ver- it's very very. I'm, I'm very appreciative. And of course, um, there is new information from new perspective of the meaning of some of the experiences that you see, or, or some of the literature that you read about in the Old Testament. That is um, absolutely fascinating. Thank you. Yeah, and yeah, so um, that is a nice segue, David, into you know. My next question is uh, uh, about, uh, you know, at this time of the year we have, um, we celebrate a special child, and that that could lead us into, you know, uh, just a little uh, uh, flavor of what, uh, people can find in your first book, uh, Alien Scriptures, and you know, uh, you, know you do uh, discuss you know, the uniqueness of you know, like the Star of Bethlehem and um, you know, Jesus uh, having an un- unusual yeah. heritage. And so, you know, uh, we can talk a little bit about th- that aspect of your book and get, get into, uh, you know, D- David wants to agree or has another angle. He has, you know, he does cover parts of the supernatural in uh, interviewing Jesus the man as well. Yeah. Well, let me put it this way. Um and, and hopefully people will read the book. My hypothesis is that Jesus was um, a hybrid um, and that uh, the star of Bethlehem was probably a craft. Now, for those of you who aren't turned off by that, please pick up the book. For those of you who are, um, let me just say this. The, 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 well, we're celebrating, you know, we're just finishing up Hanukkah. And uh, we're going into, you know, the solstice in a few, uh, in about a week or so. And so, for me, um, this is this is the season of light. And you know, after the solstice, the the days will get longer. And so, this is all about light. Not only the light uh, of, of of the cosmos and our planet but also the light within ourselves. And ironically, because I do believe the solstice in some ways is the real reason for the season in a lot of ways, ironically, this is represented by the life of a child. And that in my mind, whether you were born in Bethlehem, whether you were born in Harlem or Kandahar or Westbury, Connecticut, the child, that's the sacred part of us. That is the light within us, literally and figuratively speaking. And so for me, the season is about this hope. Now, we boiled it down to um, Jesus being the Messiah. That is the perspective. But any child that is born brings us the hope of continued life. And so I, I want to put that out there. The, the UFO stuff, uh, it's wonderful. I, I, that's some of my beliefs. You can pick up the book for that. But in some ways, whether it's a UFO or whatever it is, we can lose sight. And so I just want to posit uh, that this child is, is, is ironically in this season of darkness and cold and death that this child, any child, represents the light of life going forth. And if I can um, just kind of step in here too, we also see that the Mother Mary is pregnant with the divine inside of her, and then finally the divine 
is manifested in the material world. And with that is the hope of a new season, of a new kingdom, of a new perspective, and a new initiation, and a guide, and a, a light that we can move forward together into this new world that we're all facing. And, and, and as you also, said, Dave, I'm, Dave I'm, just one, I'm sorry. I, I, love, I love the fact that you brought up Mary because none of this would have happened without her. Right. So thank you for that. And the other thing I'd like to just piggyback on what Michael was saying is that one of Jesus' kingdom of heaven sayings, and he had, he had 22, he said the kingdom of heaven are like these little children. And so there's yeah. an aspect of ourselves that needs to recognize the way in which children act and play and interact with each other and are imaginative and are not hung up on literal truth. They're, they want to explore the world, see the world, engage with the world, and make friends with everybody, so as many people as they can. There's something very, you know, special about, you know, childhood. And Jesus recognized it. Okay. And, and you know, I have to... And it's something that we all want to go back to. And it, here's another part to that. As an artist, uh, when I look at some of the older artists, they're all aspiring as they get older to be childlike once again with their work. So there right. seems to be this eternal return of wanting to go back to a much more simpler time and a much more engaging time and a magical time. So. Oh, I, I agree with you, and, and I think that's uh, maybe so, so, some of the reason why uh, Barbara and I are ha having so many people enjoy the show is, you know, we're, I think we're just tr trying to maybe do s some of the same things. And, uh, just going back to more of the wonders that uh, 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 really goes back to uh, the conversation I had with uh, Jason Gerald right before the show was, um, yeah, you know, there, there, there are really so, so many wonders that uh, are there. You know, we can almost kind of touch them. It, we, uh, I'm not talking about the sensationalism type stuff, but the, you know, there there are some wonders in just history that make us really think and, and you know, get get our minds working and trying to wrap our heads around some of these experiences that are m more real and you know, I think you know, with Barbara's guidance you know, this is may, may explain why some of the um, explains so, some of our success is you know, um, uh, we're not going so far out there that people can't relate to us I, I have to agree with you, David, as you know, just my little personal side note there and what, what you just what you just said. Well, I think that if we get so abstract, we we lose everything. Yeah. And we lose kind of our humanity and we lose our, our connection with others and we have um, almost nothing to say. However, I think we need to have the, those elements of genius, and sometimes it's the geniuses that are going to push mankind forward because they can see something that we can't. So it's a little bit of a double-edged sword. I want to go back to the children for just a minute because children, when they're born, are, are innocent, clean slates, and they have to be taught anger, fear, bigotry, that they have to be taught all of those kind of concepts. And if children were left on their own, we'd probably have a peaceful, a, peace, a more peaceful world. And I think listening to children 
is really important because their idea of reality and and of what the world should be is more pure than most adults. And um, not I'm not saying turn the government over to them because you know then then we wouldn't have any school and you know every day would be a vacation and th- there would be a lot of chaos. But but I am saying that that the 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 innocence that, that is born into this world is shaped by the world, and we are all part of that world. And it's our responsibility to be living examples of the philosophy of the spirit within us in order to teach. It's, it's actions, not words, so much that are what teach children today. And there's a whole new way of schooling children. That's very, very different than anything that we grew up with. Hopefully it's better. I think so. Because it's honoring the creativity within each of the children and recognizing what they need and what they want so that they yeah, can I, be enhanced. I so think, in great, and So that they can involve their own creativity and their own choices. Yeah, I spent 25 years in the classroom, so um, I look at the education system today and I cringe because we're not educating our kids anymore. We're teaching them to test. Yes. Well, my um, uh, I have a family member, and she's learning. She's teaching children at I think it's five years old, four or five years old, and what she tells me and the way she teaches is so remarkable and so new and so fresh and so exciting that I wish I was at that age all over again. <laughs> then there's hope. <laughs> yes. Okay, and let's see, where, <clears throat> where else do we need to get? Oh, I don't know. Uh, Michael was glad that um, you... Uh, brought up the importance of uh, Mary and you know, another person, a you know, major figure that um, you know, we haven't really just uh, got into yet, but uh, you know, David uh, really makes some interesting points about him is uh, John the Baptist. Um, you know, D- David, you were um, um, a, a little earlier, you were talking about, um, you know, how, how did Jesus get to, um, you know, the the you know point where he was, um, you know, doing doing his ministry, you know, some of the uh, cultural influences affecting him, but uh, uh, you know, we didn't talk about, um the importance of John that you bring up in interviewing Jesus. Uh, you, you, just, you want to talk about this major figure for a uh, f- few minutes? Yeah. So um, in my book, John the Baptist is right in the middle of the book, and it's designed very specifically because Jesus was something before he went to John, and then when he went to John and after John, he became something else. So before John, he was a carpenter, and after John, he's a prophet. So there is something very specific and very something very important that John brought to Jesus' life where he was able to make that transition. And I looked at um, that moment and recognized the importance of that moment. Now, the other question that I asked, um, when you open up uh, the New Testament and you you go to the Gospel of Mark, Jesus is standing at the edge of John's ministry about to be baptized. And the question that I had was, why would you do that? Because the bigger question was, if you're telling me something about the Father, did you know the Father before you went to John? Or did you learn about the Father because you were baptized? And 
everything came down to motive. So what was motivating Jesus to move or to walk the 90 miles, roughly, to um, the Jordan River where John was? And it could have been symbolic. It could have been for a variety of reasons. But from kind of a nuts and bolts perspective, I saw that there was something that Jesus needed from John that helped Jesus become the the man he was in his ministry. And there was a fire in John. There was an attitude that John had. There was a conviction that John had. And that was something that Jesus I think needed, and John was able to convey that to him. It was more than just a baptism, I think. At least that's my my point of view. And after okay. John, Jesus was able to conduct his ministry with a fire and an enthusiasm and a direction and a forcefulness that possibly he might not have had if it wasn't because of John. It's all about good teachers. Mentoring is a very important issue in the growth of everybody or anybody. Mm-hmm. And being able to bridge, you know, that kind of the, the final touches in a finishing school, so to speak, before you go out into the world to do what you need to do. Because, believe me, the ministry is its own educational uh, classroom but you need to have a lot of things in your tool belt before you can get to that. And John seems to be the very last bit of um, information that Jesus needed. Because at that point, he's not as long. Didn't he for a while, though, take on doing the same thing that John the Baptist had done, and then he realized that that wasn't really the direction he was supposed to go? He was supposed to, you know do the preaching instead of the baptisms? I think, that, well, when you read the uh, Gospel of John, that's definitely the case. He is He's emulating John. In the other Gospels, he's not. He's leaving, and he's going out in the desert. So I felt that I, I couldn't quite reconcile those two impulses and those two directions because they were so different. You know, how do you go from being baptized and going right into the the desert for 40 days versus um, going to the the marriage of Cana, then um, Jerusalem, and then baptizing? It that didn't something. There's two traditions there, and I the only way that I can reconcile that was that Jesus was emulating John because that was what he felt that he needed to do until he finally realized what his his true voice was. And at that point, he had to go find it. He had to find his own ministry. And the traveling part seemed to be more to his personality than being fixed in one kind of location. Because Jesus at any time could have opened up a school and said, hey, everybody come to me, like John the Baptist. But he didn't. So his personality is one of of, mo- of motion and movement. And I think that he he felt more inspired by that than the other way. It, um, David, you uh, mentioned travel, and you, know, you and Michael have d- done travels in, in the Holy Land. Um, it, it, how did those experiences inform you know, d- deep in your sense of faith, or you know, what was the impact on you? Well, I haven't been to the Holy Lands, but I have been to Turkey, and I have been to the base of Mount Ararat. And, you know, Mount Ararat is the location where Noah's Ark is supposed to be uh, residing. When I got to the base of uh, Mount Ararat, is actually two um, volcanic peaks. They're they're huge. And my experience when I got to the base of that was really overwhelming. And we were talking about reincarnation earlier in the show. I mm-hmm. knew when I was at the base of those mountains that I used to live in that area. It was that powerful. 
But I got down to uh, the closest I got to the Holy Lands is I got to uh, the border of Syria and just across the river from Syria. And, and uh, what did you think of, uh, you know, be, being so close to, you know, uh, you know, the Holy Land, and you know, I I've never been there, so I I you know, I'm just wanting to learn along along with our listeners. You know, you know, what did you think about the, you know, your travels through Turkey and. Um, the traveling with Turkey was a very profound experience for me, and it is one of those countries that ex- is ancient, and mm-hmm. uh, the roads are ancient, and there are remnants pretty much where a lot of where we went that you can see where the, the Romans were, you can see where the Hittites were, um, you can see where, you know, at the base of Mount Ararat, where um, Noah's Ark was, there was a an opening for me, kind of on a spiritual level and on a heart level and kind of on a conscious level, in which this particular energy was really, really difficult, but I embraced it, and I seem to have, like, kind of come out of that with a whole new insight, a whole new dynamic, a whole new energy, and a whole new kind of lust for life. Uh, it's a, It was a very beautiful country. There's a lot of hills. There's a lot of valleys. There's a lot of rolling um, plains. And there's just a very ancient quality about it. And it, um, I felt it. Let's just put it that way. I felt it. And there's a, an incredible beauty to it. And I even got to Hagia Sophia, which is, you know, one of the cathedrals um, Mm -hmm. that was built in, uh, well, it's Istanbul, but at that time it was Constantinople. And, again, I just had another profound experience of just being able to walk into this this, um, building that's dedicated to the divine and just feel connected not only to myself but to the the energy of the building and to... um, Kind of divine energies. It was just overwhelming. Well, and, and how, how about you, Michael? You have been to Jerusalem. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, well, obviously, what strikes you is the beauty of the land. Um, how uh, and and how you know Jerusalem, being city of peace, has really been uh, the history of so much bloodshed. It was just to be in that energy to say, you know, now when I went to uh, Golgotha, I, I realized Jesus wasn't crucified right on this spot. But just being in that energy, uh, being around that kind of history. And what struck me is, you know, just people willing to die uh, for this. There's a sacredness of the land. We haven't seen anything like that here in this country um, this reverence, except, you know, before the European came to uh, North America and, and the indigenous tribes here, this, this land, this sense of place, this, this sense of history. And uh, it was just wonderful to be there with all of the layers, uh, you know, seeing that this, this, this area is, uh, is the home of, the three monotheistic religions, Judaism, yes. Islam, and Christianity. And so it's a trip that I still uh, treasure um, and probably always uh, uh, will be. It came at the right time in my life. I was graduating uh, from seminary, and my first ex-wife, who was Jewish, uh, we said, let's do it. Let's let's go there. I met some wonderful people and uh but just being in that energy and, you know, a play, it's like, it's a little different, but my friends who fought in Vietnam, they said, Michael, it's such a beautiful country where they're looking at it from the helicopter. And they're saying, but this beauty beneath it is just so much strife. And uh, that's, that's what struck me. 
I think what Michael is saying and what I'm saying is both of these cultures, you know, from Turkey and in Jerusalem, you're going back thousands and thousands of years. And I felt it. And you can sense there is something special about the land and its traditions and its history. And I had never felt anything like that at anywhere until there. I got there. And I and, and Michael's describing the same kind of experience when he gets to Jerusalem and Golgotha. There's something yeah, yeah, about I, that area yeah. that I, I, you I just realize it is just so yeah. ancient with all those civilizations. It, 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 yeah, because now, now where I live here in Appalachian Mountains, there's that sacredness because – uh, some say that this, these are the oldest mountain ranges on the planet. Well, maybe wow. they are, but but the Cherokee here um, they have that reference. I feel I felt it uh, also, you know, out west in Arizona, uh, you know, around the New Mexico area. Uh, it, it was that feeling, but it was a little bit on steroids. Only because, as a man of the West, I'm not compare that 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 it's more or less than Aboriginal people, but being a man of the West and of the Enlightenment, I was educated in that way. And all the world, you know, the three monotheistic religions are right there. And I'm walking there. I'm walking, and I'm going in and out of a bar. I'm going to see the sights. I'm going to have a dinner. And uh, you, 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 I don't think you can be there. You can be an atheist and not just feel the presence of history. You may not even believe it, but it's there. Yeah, you're being bathed in this, you know, invisible energy of of history. And the power yeah. that still re- that resonates there because of it. And, and uh, D- David, you bring up in your book that... Um, you know, a you know, so, so somewhat new uh, uh, topic that uh, in your profiles of Jesus, uh, you know, probably did a lot of uh, traveling a- as well during his lost years, and you know, th- th- they are reflected in h- his parables. You know, we're uh, down, and I'm watching the clock. Um, we're down about seven seven minutes. So, uh, if you want to take a couple minutes to uh, just say something about that subject, and you know, just uh, let people know the uh, diversity in your book. Right. So there's t- uh, there's several parts to this, and one was if I'm looking at Jesus, what. What I attempted to uh, accomplish with this book was to recreate and re-understand Jesus based off of his his sayings. And so I wanted to develop a personality profile, and I wanted to really kind of understand who he was. And the theology says one thing, but I put that aside, and I looked at his personality through his sayings and through the actions of his ministry. And so one of the things that comes up in his ministry was his travels. He went to Tyre and Sidon. He went around the Galilee. He went down to Jerusalem several times back. Uh, When he was born, his parents fled, and they ended up going down into Egypt. So we're seeing Jesus as a traveler. And I ask myself, are you learning travel on the job? Or are you learning about travel because you're comfortable going to all these new places? And when I then flipped over to his sayings, he would talk, well, excuse me, he he seems to be inspired by several different types of cultures and several different ideas. So there is a a Hebrew nature to his, his parables and his stories. And what he is drawing upon. There is also the Essenes. He's drawing from the Essenes. He is also drawing from the Greeks and the Greek philosophy and Greek um, uh, rhetoric. 
he's also drawing from some Egyptian and some of the mystery religions. But then the one that's more fascinating was the drawing and the inspiration from the East. So there is a sprinkling of Taoism. There is a sprinkling of Buddhism and Hinduism and Confucianism. And that made me realize that Jesus seemed to have gotten his information outside of the general locale of Israel. So the question is, did he travel all the way over to, say, India and get that? Well, there are legends, there are history within India that says, yes, he did. So I cannot say for sure he did that. All I can say is is that the inspiration seems to come from that area. It would be very difficult for somebody to be that influenced by Eastern philosophy without being touched by it in some way, unless it's a universal library that he was able to tap into. And you know, maybe he was able to do that. I don't know. Uh, uh, no, uh, you, know you do make an interesting uh, uh, case, and you know, it's, uh, it's convincing. You can see why David was probably killed in other lifetimes. <laughs> you can see why he's had a problem uh, these many years. I happen to agree with him. So um, he was a very cultured <laughs> man. He was very adept at understanding lots of different um, perspectives. He had the mind for it, and he had the heart for it. And he had the physicality for it. So, And that's underestimated. The fact that he's able to do what he did, I call it a feat of endurance. And he always is up to the challenge of being of doing things that are just going to um, expend the most amount of energy to maximize the most amount of um, reward for what it is that he's trying to accomplish. And okay. he's using his body to do it. And it had okay. to be a tough body. Yeah, and, a tough and mind. Uh, yeah, uh, we're we're down to three minutes. Uh, do you, uh, both of you can give your uh, websites, then you know we'll need to start wrapping up the show. Okay, Michael, you go. Uh, just uh, Michael J. S. Carter. Uh, dot com. Uh, Michael J. S. Carter at gmail dot com is uh, is my email. The first one was my website, or you can just type in Reverend Michael J. S. Carter on on Amazon. And I just want to wish everyone, whatever faith tradition or no faith tradition, wishing you a wonderful time uh, this holiday season. Um. I am the author. My name is David Collis, and I'm the author of Interviewing Jesus the Man. And my website is www.davidcollis.com. And I have David Collis author page on Facebook. And you can follow me on um, both of those. Uh, and you can contact me through um, both uh, my web, uh, website and my uh, Facebook page. And again, since it is the holiday seasons, I just wish everybody, you know, a fabulous uh, a Christmas. Yeah, and I just want to thank uh, you, you and Michael for being our terrific guests tonight. And you know, uh, I'm I, I think Barbara's going to do a show a day after Christmas. So uh, you know, just keep checking her website. Uh, and I'm, I, um, next show I'm going to be doing is I think the I think January 3rd, and we have uh, an interesting January lineup. So you know, I, I'm just I'm not going anywhere. I'm just you know, Barbara's doing a show next Tuesday. Then we're off for a couple, or I'll, I'm off for a couple weeks. But uh, you know, for uh, fans like the the Red Dragon Rider, I'll be uh, you know, the Red Boy Voice will be M- Mark, back in t- early January. Mark, it's time to say good night, Mark. Yeah. Okay. 
Well, I, I, one I, word, Mark. You got one word. Bad. 